our money and how to use it. The announcement which I just made, though lengthy, was necessary. May I now proceed with this afternoon's discussion. It will deal with something that is very constitutional, and as such with something that shall be championed by every American citizen. It will deal with a portion of our third principle which concerns the nationalization of certain public necessities. It is directly associated with the greatest material obstacle which is powerful enough to prevent the laboring man from obtaining a just and living wage. In brief, I am going to talk to you about money and about the necessity of making it our national servant. As we analyze our economic life, we cannot escape the obvious facts of unemployment, the universal poverty, and of the ever-increasing concentration of wealth in the hands of a few. Three or four years ago, we pinched ourselves when we became conscious that there was want in the midst of plenty. Surely, thought we, the editors of the daily press, the experts of business and of banking, as well as the professional economists, could not be wrong. They were the wise men. We must be the fools. Therefore, one and all, we swallowed the teachings of the financialists as easily as though they were oysters. But there came a day of rude awakening when the laboring man had ample leisure to sit and think thoughts that were heretical to the theologians of high finance. Gradually there simmered down in the mass mind of America two definite thoughts which expressed the two salient errors of modern finance and business. The conclusions which these laws represented were like a sum in arithmetic which has finally been solved. Here was the sum. There was want in the midst of plenty. There was a superabundance of wealth about us. Money, which is only the receipt of wealth, was lacking. The bookkeepers of our national wealth, otherwise known as bankers, had perverted the true concept of money. Wheat is wealth. A new motor car is wealth. A new home is wealth. A new suit of clothing is wealth. Whenever the hand of man bestowed its benediction upon field or forest or mine or factory, new wealth had been produced. This is how we knew positively. But the bankers had been dishonest in their bookkeeping, in their writing of receipts. The books did not balance. The receipts did not equal the real wealth that had been produced. There was a purposeful scarcity of money. In our sum of addition, we added up all these and other facts, and the answer became clear as crystal. It was the dishonest trick of deceptive bookkeeping that made business operations, agricultural pursuits, and industrial labor return to the financiers twice as much as the bankers invested in them. That is law number one. Now the sinister significance of this law rose from its basic association and with another assumption of banking, which we will call law number two. This second law in brief proclaimed that the banker shall be the sole and only distributor of wealth. He shall have the only right to manufacture money and with it to issue the receipts of wealth, the credits. Gradually it dawned upon the laborer and the farmer that if modern private banking is the sole creator of money, it cannot gather into the vaults of its banks the double repayment of its original investment in terms of money because the amount of money in circulation was not equivalent to the wealth produced. Consequently, the banker, with his policy of gathering more than he invested, was forced to take ownership of the real wealth, of the homes and of the farms and the factories. He was forced to exploit the laborer as he compelled him to go without the dollar bills or the receipts that he should have had in his purse. 
He destroyed purchasing power as he headed himself and his associates together with the entire nation into the last ditch of destruction. Thus we were surrounded by wealth, but because of a lack of adequate receipts, of adequate currency, of adequate purchasing power, we were compelled to starve while our fields were heavy with grain, to go unclad while the spindles in our factories were anxious to work. All this was because the bookkeeping of bankers and their manufactured receipts of money were unsound, all because money as conceived by them had been so perverted that it was no longer a receipt for wealth, for labor, for wheat, and for homes, but was wealth itself. Now we began to understand that both the nature of the banker's money and the nature of its dishonest receipts. We also began to understand why an industrialist or a homemaker who borrowed $1,000 from the banker was merely given credit for $1,000, but no $1,000 bill was created. All that the banker did was to write upon his books a fictitious creation of a thousand-dollar bill which he called a deposit and to hand the borrower a checkbook. But the banker was not content to be paid back by means of the checkbook. He wanted a thousand-dollar bill that had not been created. He did not want to be paid back in credit. He wanted to be paid back in a real receipt for wealth, which he alone was permitted by an unconstitutional law to create. If the borrower tried to create it, he was called a counterfeiter and his receipt for his thousand dollar bill was regarded as spurious. As a result of this unsound bookkeeping or banking policy, debts grew to such an enormity that they were unpayable in real money. Individuals searched their pockets for the dime that was not there, each believing himself to be in the debt of the other. In truth, they were only in debt to a system, to a program of racketeering. Every house that was built, every furrow that was plowed, every motor car that was manufactured only added to our debt system. In the history of ancient Greek mythology, we were told the story where a young man was eternally punished by being forced to roll a stone uphill and always succeeding in rolling downhill the moment it neared the top. This young man's stone did not grow bigger as he rolled it, but our stone of debt grows bigger with each generation and rolls further downhill with every attempt we make to roll it uphill. Businessman, industrialist, laborer, and farmer, in the name of God, How long are you going to subscribe to the heresy that money is wealth, when it is only supposed to be the receipt of wealth? How long do you intend to bear with the practice of permitting the banker to issue credit and then demand from you real money that was never created? How long will your patience dictate to you to suffer privation in the midst of plenty and to pay back the banker with your farm, with your home, and with the wails of your hungry children and ill-kept wife because the bankers have purposefully failed to issue sufficient receipts for the real wealth of the nation? Let us pause to study the actual historical facts associated with this questionable right of a banker to coin and regulate the value of money and thereby to issue fewer receipts than the wealth of the nation demands. The Constitution of the United States provides that our Congress shall have the power to create the Army and the Navy, to establish and operate the post office system, to levy taxes and to collect them, and to coin money and regulate the value thereof. 
Now, what would be your reaction if a group of men proposing that our government should deregulate the power of creating an army to some munitions manufacturer, that it should sublet our post office system to some mail order house, that it should grant a charter to some great public utility, thereby bestowing upon it the power of levying taxes? Offhand, I dare to express the opinion that the American people would consider this unconstitutional, dangerous, and destructive to the welfare of this nation. The same thought you have regarding the Army, Navy, and Post Office in association with the power to coin and regulate the value thereof. It is not a power to be delegated. It is neither a privilege nor a right to sublet to any group of citizens. My friends, despite your almost unanimous approval of this statement, that very thing has been accomplished in a most questionable matter, perhaps unconstitutional manner. Here in the history of this case, in the year 1791, Alexander Hamilton, our first Secretary of the Treasury, petitioned George Washington to have Congress grant the right and privilege of coining money to certain of Mr. Hamilton's wealthy associates. He advocated the establishment of a private bank for this very purpose. As was to be expected, the father of our country opposed this nefarious plan on the grounds that it was contrary to the Constitution, which provides, as I have just remarked, that Congress shall have the power to coin money and regulate its value. Supporting our first president were Mr. Edmund Randolph, the Attorney General, and Mr. Thomas Jefferson, the first Secretary of State, who, by the way, had considerable to do with framing the Declaration of Independence. He declared that such a transgression was entirely repugnant to the spirit of this democratic republic. Eventually, however, Mr. Hamilton succeeded in establishing this so-called Bank of the United States. What a peculiar name for this first bank. How inappropriate the appellation, where only 20% of this bank's stock was held by the United States Treasury and 80% of it by private individuals, the vast majority of whom were foreigners. Here we have the origin of the privately owned banks, the banks in which you trusted so implicitly, the banks which operate under colors of our country's name and which failed you in a crisis, the banks over which the government had no management other than that of inspection. The first bank operated under a charter which permitted its directors and owners to print or coin money by purchasing United States government bonds, which bonds, by the way, were left on deposit in the United States Treasury. At the present moment, I quote for you the thought which Thomas Jefferson expressed shortly after this private banking business originated. I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than our standing armies. Already they have raised up a money aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing power should be taken from the banks and restored to the government and to the people to whom it properly belongs. On the expiration of this banker's charter in 1811, it ceased functioning. In the year 1816, a 20-year charter was granted to a second group which wished to establish a second private bank. Four years before the expiration of this charter, Mr. Nichols Biddle, the president of this new bank, informed Andrew Jackson, then president of the nation, that he would guarantee his re-election if the bank charter could be extended another 20 years. Here we have the banker not only lobbying but practically attempting to bribe our chief executive. To his everlasting honor, Andrew Jackson refused this bribe and declared, 
If Congress has the right under the Constitution to issue paper money, it was given them to be used by themselves, not to be delegated to individuals or corporations. On this platform of uncompromising justice, Andrew Jackson was re-elected to the presidency despite the opposition of Mr. Biddle and his private corporation of bankers. To the testimony of Washington, of Jefferson, and of Jackson, may I add the name of Lincoln's Secretary of the Treasury, Mr. Salmon P. Chase, who wrote the following prophetic words. My agency in procuring the passage of the National Bank Act was the greatest financial mistake of my life. It has built up a monopoly that affects every interest in the country. It should be repealed, but before this can be accomplished, the people will be arrayed on one side and the banks on the other in a contest such as we have never seen before in this country. If we ever in the history of this nation, its spirit, its liberty, and its constitution were revered and understood, none surpass in reverence and in intelligence with these noble four, Washington, Jefferson, Jackson, and Lincoln. That is the story of the monopolization of coining and regulating money at a precious profit. It was like handing over the ownership of the town pump or of the city's water supply to a group of private individuals. This private right to coin and regulate the value of money, to keep currency inadequate, to call in credit at pleasure, to demand payment of loans with dollar bills when they are not sufficient dollar bills to go around, to reap wheat where they have only sown cockle, these things belong to the heart and soul of modern capitalism, not to Americanism. These principles and economic system which sustains them are incontestably false if for no other argument than for the proven results. This system produced only an immense number of propertyless wage earners on one hand, and of a small handful of bankers and banker-controlled industrialists who have concentrated the wealth of the nation within their very grasp. I know that I shall be regarded as radical and as dangerous for telling you these historical facts and for reminding you that these truths relative to money. But I should prefer to be termed a radical rather than subscribe, like a crackpot, to utterances of modern banking as if they came down from some financial Mount Sinai, immutable and eternal. Yesterday, the banker in his philosophy of scarce money, of dishonest receipts, acquired a dignity that paralyzed opposition. But today, in the midst of poverty, in the midst of universal distress, we must look upon his vapid pronouncements as nothing more than the idle incantations of an Indian medicine man. What has been the history of the banker? Trace his ancestry back far enough and you will find that his professional forebears were dishonest slaves who kept account of their master's wealth under the Caesars of Rome and the pharaohs of Egypt. In biblical days, the banker was the unjust steward who throttled the servant while he cheated the master. In modern times, what has he produced to help civilization overcome the handicaps of un untamed nature? Nothing. Of all human technicians, the banker is the most patent and grotesque failure especially since the World War, when we placed upon his head the crown of intelligence and in his hand the scepter of omnipotence. The world has gone from failure to failure. All our material failures are failures in the field of finance. In no other sphere of human activity has a breakdown occurred in the last decade. The farmer, the laborer, and the industrialist, and the housewife all have carried on heroically against the most tremendous odds ever faced by this or any other nation. They have been successful in producing real wealth. That the banker is a failure is attested by the condition of every country today. He is civilization's tragic comedian. That he is ruining us is bad enough, 
but it is a little too much that he should demand from us admiration and obedience to his suggestions for doing it. For generations he has gazed upon a world that, by the common consent of himself, has made blossom like a rose. He deems himself responsible for all that has turned into a workshop of marvels. The truth is that there is not, nor was there ever in our world, a worthwhile marvel that sprang from a banker's brain. It is a brain that is identified with the non-creative things of this world. It has neither pride of ancestry nor hope of posterity, because its functions are the functions of a sterile mule. The nail, the wheel, the wireless, the airplane, the benedictions of medicine, the artist of surgery, the devisals of the engineer, the miracles of the chemist, all the steps in that patient progression from the squalor of the primeval swamp and are the patient creations of the creators, the workmen of the world, not one of them of a banker. He has been the parasite that has lived by them and from them and in them. Thus, the crisis in the world today is, in truth, the battle between labor and science and culture and religion and art on one side, and the banker and the banker-controlled industrialist on the other. It is a battle waged by those who identify property rights with human rights against those who prefer the dignity of human rights as more sacred than property rights. The challenge has been cast in your very face, my fellow citizens. Those who wish to protect property right of scarce money and the men who persist in getting themselves heard through the columns of the press and in the corridors of the capital, these same men, as they succeed in retaining their unconstitutional privilege of coining and regulating the value of money, will obstruct any living and just wage and any sane hope of prosperity to the farmer and the businessman. By its very nature, their money system claims that it owns or will own every item of wealth in this nation. Ask any laborer or any farmer why the former is idle and destitute and why the latter is forced to pursue a calling at a loss. And the answer is identical from Maine to California, from Minnesota to Mississippi. There is no money. This is the common answer to our common economic ills. Because there is no money, because there are too many debts which the bankers will exact payment of either in real money that has not been created or in the real wealth of homes and farms, confiscations must continue. Want in the midst of plenty must be the order of the day as God's blessings of plenitude are frustrated. Throughout the generations of the human race has been undergoing an absolution from the original curse placed upon Adam, our first parent. In the beginning, one ate his bread only by the sweat of his brow. In the beginning, thorns and thistles, both in the field and in the mind of man, obstructed progress. But man's efforts, coupled with God's will, have been working out that curse by making human labor more and more productive. It is the modern banking system of capitalism which has intervened at the suspicious moment to throw us back hundreds of thousands of years to that day of original struggle. I repeat that there is no hope for a just and living wage as long as this system survives. Money must be coined and regulated by the Congress of this nation. Money must be regarded as a receipt for wealth. Contrary to the view of modern baking, I do not regard the creation of wealth as an evil. We are wealthy. We can become wealthier. I do not subscribe to the doctrine of purposeful poverty because there is a purposeful scarcity of money. With this thought in mind, I would propose that a network of federal highways shall be built over the face of America. Highways amply large, highways electrically lighted, here then is real national wealth. 
This construction will facilitate the distribution of the golden grain of the West to the crowded cities of the East. I would propose a national plan of vast reforestation almost to the extent of 50 million square miles. The saplings of today will become the cedar and pine, the oak and the hemlock of tomorrow. Within 30 years, 50 million square miles of reforested land would approximately produce 1,220,000,000 feet of precious lumber. That will be a contribution to the coming generation. Generation. I would propose to multiply both power and light distribution for the populous east by harnessing the rapids of the St. Lawrence waters. Remember how both the English and French fought ferociously to gain possession of the plains and of this continent. With this thought in mind, I propose to set aside the policy of destructionism and endeavor to reclaim 60 million acres of agricultural land which, though not required by us of this day and age, will be a heritage to future generations, a heritage of real wealth. Remembering that our citizens are the most valuable asset which we as a nation possess, I propose to marshal an army of idle workmen who, armed with dynamite, will demolish the slums of our cities. In their place, I propose to construct habitable homes equipped with the conveniences to which we are entitled. Who can gainsay me that a home is not real wealth? What would I use for money to realize this dream of American prosperity? If you sincerely inquire of me, I remind you that Congress has the right to coin money. I will doubly remind you that money is nothing more than a receipt for wealth. The network of roads, 18,000 miles of them at $18,000 a mile equals $324 million. 50 million acres of reforestation will cost approximately $6,400,000,000. The harnessing of the St. Lawrence and other rivers so that they will surrender 7 million horsepower can be achieved for $812,000,000. The reclaiming of 60 million acres of agricultural land at $10 an acre will require an expenditure of $600 million. 900,000 homes at $2,000 each will demand of us $1,800,000,000. Here is a total government expenditure of approximately $10 billion. In our treasury, we have $9 billion of metallic money, of gold and silver. Against this fabulous hoard, there is nothing which prevents us issuing $23 billion worth of currency, if necessary, whereas we ask for the issuance of not more than $5 billion of it. The remaining $5 billion would be in the United States credit money. These public works I would undertake in opposition to the theories of private banking, which insist that if we engage in any such projects, it shall be with money borrowed from the bankers and written down upon their books with the dead hand of debt. No more borrowing from the bankers. We have nine billion of idle gold and silver in our treasury. For God's sake, let it be put to work instead of borrowing bankers' dollars and tying around the necks of future generations the noose of suicide and debt. I would enter upon this public works program with our own United States money, which Congress and Congress alone has the power to issue and to regulate according to our Constitution, and independent of any banker. Would this be a permanent program? Most certainly, for it means the permanent end of depressions, the permanent end of production for the banker's profit. The moment that industry fails to employ a man at an annual wage, that very moment there should be a place for that individual labor, either in road building and reforestation or in the construction of power plants, in the reclamation of agricultural lands, or in the clearing of slums, at a salary of not less than $1,500 a year. 
Soon the purchasing power of the country would be restored. Soon our independence would be gained from the Tory-minded banking fraternity. Soon the wheels of industry would be asked to spin again, supplying the needs of those who are craving the products of our factories. At this juncture, when industry requires more men, the permanent public works program can slacken its pace and supply the factories with every necessary laborer. My friends, this is no utopia. This is no idle dream. It is within your realization. If you learn to consider money as nothing more than the receipt of wealth, and if you insist that Congress shall restore to itself its constitutional right to be used, not for the favorable few, but for the common good and commonwealth of all our citizens, here is prosperity for all, prosperity for the laborer and for the farmer, for industrialist and for a professional man. There is no need of putting up with unnecessary poverty. Reply to Cardinal O'Connell. As a preface to these last remarks which I am going to make, may I inform this audience that they are written only after consultation with His Excellency, Michael James Gallagher, Bishop of Detroit. They are remarks which will cause, perhaps, bitter thoughts and bitter words throughout the length and breadth of America. But the time has come when patience ceases to be a virtue and silence, nothing more than a cowardly subterfuge. I am going to speak to you about his eminence, William Cardinal O'Connell of Boston, who has recently celebrated his birthday by publicly attacking me for the third time in as many years. On the two previous occasions, I was content to pass the matter over. This time, and on all future occasions, the matter will not be passed over. Cardinal O'Connell himself has invited this public utterance. First of all, the Venerable Cardinal lays down the rule that a priest should talk to his parishioners and a bishop should confine himself to utterances within his own diocese. Let it be understood that the Cardinal has no jurisdiction over me, that he has no jurisdiction outside his own diocese, that the dignity of the scarlet which he wears as Cardinal confers no more power upon him in his governing of the Catholic Church in America than does the purple toga worn by a Monsignor give him power within the diocese wherein he resides. Remembering this principle, William Cardinal O'Connor has no authority to speak for the Catholic Church in America and has no business, as a churchman, to impose his thoughts on people living outside his jurisdiction. It is high time that this bubble be bursted. If he spoke as a churchman on the three occasions when he publicly rebuked me, he has done nothing more than to usurp the power which belongs to the apostolic delegate in America. If he spoke as an individual, which he did, his utterances carry no more weight than they justly deserve. He himself said that he spoke as a layman. Since he prefers to be regarded as a layman, I, I shall speak to him as if he were a layman. I am criticized by his eminence as he insinuates that I am doing something contrary to the wishes of my ecclesiastical superiors. As a matter of fact, I am simply carrying out the command of my highest ecclesiastical superior, His Holiness Pope Pius XI, in preaching the principles of social justice and the doctrines of the encyclicals, his predecessor, Leo XIII, said, Every minister of holy religion must throw into the conflict all the energy of his mind and all the strength of his endurance. Pius XI not only encourages the clergy to bend their every effort to this most important question of the age, but he criticizes those who refuse, either through apathy or ignorance, or through some other motive, to stress, in season and out of season, the doctrines predicated by Leo XIII. Of these men he said, There are some who seem to attach little importance to this encyclical, and to the present anniversary celebration. These men either slander a doctrine of which they are entirely ignorant, or, if not unacquainted with its teaching, they betray their failure to understand it, or else they would understand that if they lay themselves open to the charge of base injustice and ingratitude. 
For 40 years, William Cardinal O'Connell has had the opportunity to preach and practice social justice and, in fact, has been commanded to do this according to the letters received by him and by every other bishop from Pope Leo XIII. For 40 years, William Cardinal O'Connell has been more notorious for his silence on social justice than for any contribution which he may have given either in practice or in doctrine towards the decentralization of wealth and towards the elimination of those glaring injustices which permitted the plutocrats of this nation to wax fat at the expense of the poor. Now he castigates me for doing what I was ordered to do. William Cardinal O'Connell practically accuses me of misinterpreting the encyclicals of both Leo XIII and Pius IX. Every word that I have written has received the imprimatur of my right reverend bishop. When this is taken into consideration, William Cardinal O'Connell practically accuses a brother bishop who for years has been famed in Michigan for his defense of the poor and for his opposition to the type of pampered evils which have been so rampant in the textile industries of New England. May I repeat that the Cardinal of Boston has had 40 years in which to carry out the commands of Leo XIII, and he now seeks front-page publicity by attacking me for attempting to follow out those commands. He has asked for this reply, and he has obtained it. Since William Cardinal O'Connell has persisted on three occasions, dragging this matter before the public, instead of discussing it in private with the proper authorities, I invite him on future occasions either to carry the case where it belongs, or else to be informed that, despite the dignity of honors conferred upon him, which I respect, I shall take advantage of the prerogative which he himself invited of distinguishing the cardinal from a private layman and treat him as a layman in public. I repeat that I have had three years in which to consider the voicing of these remarks. They have been voiced only after consultation with my lawful ecclesiastical superior. I am still a humble priest that I pray and I pray, Almighty God, that at the end of the long reign of this distinguished prelate, nothing will cause him to echo the words which Shakespeare placed in the mouth of Cardinal Wolsey. Had I but served my God with half the zeal I served my king, he would not in mine age have left me naked to mine enemies.